you've ever ridden in an ambulance, you know that the objective is what? The objective is to get you to the hospital as fast as they possibly can. Uh, You've experienced it on the road. Emergency personnel has the permission to exceed the speed limit. Here you are, speed limit's 45, you're going 55, (laughs) ambulance blows right past you. They have permission to exceed the speed limit. They have permission to to run through stop signs. Why, they even have these apparatuses that let them change traffic lights. You've been there and all of a sudden here comes this ambulance and you're about ready to go and it's coming the other direction and the light changes just for the ambulance to make it through. Here's the idea, that ambulance driver cannot get distracted. That ambulance driver cannot get diverted. On the way to the hospital, there's no time to stop and call a friend. There's no time to observe the beautiful scenery around it. If you're being transported in an ambulance, you don't want your driver to make a stop in the drive through at Wendy's, right? You want to what? You want to get to the hospital as fast as you possibly can. Speed is of the essence. Any delay could endanger the life of their precious cargo. Well, Jairus, one of the characters in the passage of Scripture that we're reading today, must have felt the exact same way. No, there wasn't an ambulance in the passage. (laughs) There was no traffic lights that they had to run through. But Jairus' daughter's life hung in the balance. And as Jairus comes to Jesus, he comes to Jesus with a sense of urgency, with an emergency. And he wanted Jesus to not be delayed, to not get distracted, but to respond to his need. As I mentioned, open your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 8. In just a few moments, we're going to begin reading in verse 40 of Luke chapter 8. Let me give you a little bit of background information. This is in your handout today. Luke 8 is one of the most miracle-filled chapters in the entire New Testament. Let me remind you, Luke is writing this, and one of the reasons that Luke writes this gospel is he's writing to a man named Theophilus. And the purpose of this gospel is to convince Theophilus, and yes, us as well, that Jesus is the very Son of God. As you read through Luke chapter 4, there are four miracles in this chapter that prove that Jesus was, that Jesus is no ordinary man. Jesus is God in the flesh. And so, as we read through the chapter, you would see that in verses 22 through 25, you see that while crossing the Sea of Galilee, Jesus rebukes the wind and calmed the storm with just a spoken word. You know the story, here's Jesus and the disciples out on a small boat, and as they're crossing the Sea of Galilee, the storm comes up, and and the, the boat begins to be tossed from one side to the other, so much so that the disciples begin to fear for their lives, and Here's Jesus sound asleep in the boat, and the disciples wake him up, and Jesus, with just a spoken word, calms the sea and calms the waves. The text says that the disciples were amazed at Jesus' power, so much so that they questioned, who is this man? Why, even the wind and the seas obey him. That was the first miracle. In verses 26 through 39, we find the second miracle. This is my favorite in the chapter. We see that Jesus healed a demon-possessed man, and as he cast the demons out, the demons asked if they could be sent into a herd of pigs, a herd of swine that was there close. And so in response to their request, Jesus allows the demons to enter into a herd of pigs. And as you read those verses, that herd of pigs immediately run off the cliff and drown in the sea below. (laughs) What a sight that must have been. Here's this this demon-possessed man who's all of a sudden is freed from his demon. And then those demons go into this herd of pigs and all of a sudden they rush into the sea and they drown. Needless to say, the people of that region region were not pleased with Jesus. As a matter of fact, they begged that Jesus would go away 
and leave them alone. I read verse 37 of chapter 8. If you see it in your Bibles, it says this, and all the people in the region of the Gerasenes begged Jesus to go away and leave them alone. I read that verse, and I can only imagine the regret that those people will have for all of eternity. Jesus was in their town. As we say today, Jesus was in the house. Jesus was performing miracles, and they drove him away. How sad. As we come to the passage that we're studying this morning, we find that Jesus did two additional miracles, beginning in verse 40 through verse 56. He did two additional miracles that are carefully intertwined with each other. In reality, the first miracle is interrupted by the second miracle. As a matter of fact, as you read it, and we're going to read through it in just a moment, it appears that Jesus, in taking time to address the second miracle, will cost the life of a 12-year-old girl. And as you read the story, and as I read the story, I, I sat back and there were several questions that come to my mind. Why in the world would Jesus allow himself to be delayed when the life of a 12-year-old girl hung in the balance? Well, as we study today's text, we'll not only supply the answer to that question, but we'll see what God was doing in their lives and what God is doing in our lives and we'll discover this morning that divine delays are for our purpose. God doesn't always act on our timetable, but God has a timetable. Would you pray with me this morning before we begin in our passage? Father, thank you so much that you're our portion. Lord, thank you that you have the power to calm the wind. Thank you that you have the power to calm the waves of the sea. Father, thank you that you have supreme power over the demonic world. Help us to realize this morning that there is nothing impossible for you. There's nothing. Even though situations seem impossible for us, and even though we don't see an escape, even though we don't see a remedy, Father, you are at work. Help us to see that. And help us, like the individuals in this chapter, Help us to not be afraid. Help us to have faith. Help us to believe. Thank you for what you're going to teach us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. We're gonna kind of study the passage a little bit different today. We're gonna walk through the passage. And as we walk through the passage, kind of make some comments. And at the end, we'll wrap it up with a couple of applications that I trust will be powerful or as powerful for you as they've been for me this week. The first thing that we see in your outline is this. There's a miracle that is interrupted. And notice we're in Luke chapter 8, beginning in verse 40. Luke chapter 8, verse 40. On the other side of the lake, I'll put it up on the screen if you didn't bring a Bible with you. On the other side of the lake, the crowds welcomed Jesus because they had been waiting for him. Verse 41, then a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. Let's pause there for a moment. Now, now, Jairus, as you read this, Jairus was a man of importance. Luke, Luke describes him as a leader of the synagogue. He basically would have had two responsibilities. His first responsibility would have been to organize the services there in the synagogue. He was kind of the guy that, that put the program together, that made sure things were running. He also was in charge of the maintenance of the synagogue. This guy had an extremely important position in the synagogue, and as a result, he was an influential man in the community. Everyone knew who he was. Everyone knew Jairus, why he was a leader of the synagogue. And as we see him for the very first time, we find him worried. We find him distraught. But his faith is immediately seen. As we read just a few moments ago, he falls at the feet of Jesus, pleading with Jesus to go to his home. 
Mark, who is a synoptic, who gives us a different version of the whole story. In Mark chapter 5 and verse 23, gives us the words of this man. Mark 5, 23, pleading fervently with Jesus. He says, Jesus, my little daughter is dying. Please come and lay your hands on her. Heal her so she can live. Do you, do you sense the worry in this man's heart? Imagine if you had a 12-year-old girl that was sick, that was sick to the point of death, and you have exhausted all of the medical remedies. You've seen every doctor you could possibly see. You've done every test that you possibly could do, and the doctors look at you and say, I'm sorry, there is no hope. And you realize the only hope left is Jesus. No doubt you would respond. You would arrive you would speak with Jesus in the same way that Jairus does. Well, the text tells us that Jesus consents and begins the journey to Jairus' home. Notice the middle of verse 42. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the, the fringe of his robe. Uh, if we could have today a picture of the robes that the rabbis wore in Jesus' time, there were tassels at the bottom of the robe. And uh, uh, often as a, as a rabbi, as a teacher would travel, they would take that robe and they would throw it over their back. And so no doubt there were tassels, there were fringe that was hanging off the back of the robe that was hanging down Jesus' back. And this lady reached out and just grabbed the fringe, the, the tassel soul of Jesus' garment. The verse says, immediately, immediately, the bleeding stopped. Here's what I wrote in, in my notes, and it's in your outline. As Jesus made his way to Jairus' home, a woman touches him and interrupts his journey. Now, now, Try to put yourself in the scene. As Jesus was walking, I'm sure that many people had been bumping up against him, rubbing against him, and touching him. The verses say that there was a large crowd that surrounded Jesus. But this touch was different. This touch was a plea for help. It wasn't just somebody who accidentally bumped against Jesus. It wasn't just somebody who reached out and was touching him as a fan would do. This was a plea for help. This was a touch of faith. So much so that verse 44 tells us, immediately the bleeding stopped. As I read about this this week, one author described what she did as Stealing a healing. <laughs> Stealing a healing. Think, she didn't sit beside the road waiting for Jesus to pass by. She didn't approach him and ask Jesus to heal her. She didn't call Peter on the phone and say, can I make an appointment with Jesus? I need him to do something for me. No, she kind of ambushed him. She, she interrupted his trip to heal a dying girl. Now, put yourself in the place of the disciples and the crowd who had witnessed everything that we have just read. For the disciples, for the crowd, and most of all for Jairus, the father of this 12-year-old girl, this was an unplanned interruption. This was a surprise attack. The text even says that she comes up from behind Jesus. And she touches Jesus from behind. Here's the next thing that I wrote in my notes. Without Jesus' permission, this lady, this lady demonstrated her faith, extended her hand, and was healed of her disease. Now, now you and I read this with our 21st century mindset. And, uh, you know, this is kind of a made-for-television drama, and we get it. And, you know, you can hear the music in the background as she's reaching out to touch him. And we think, boy, that's great. That was pretty easy for this lady. Just show up where Jesus is, ambush him, touch him, boom, the healing is done. But quite frankly, what this woman did was not easy. As a matter of fact, this woman demonstrated her faith in spite of several serious obstacles. Let's, let's kind of pause in our study of 
Jairus' daughter and think for just a few moments about this woman and the obstacles that she had to overcome to demonstrate her faith. The first thing we see in the text is that this lady had to fight through the crowds. Notice, notice verse 42 once again, the latter part of the verse, it says, as Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. The English Standard Version describes it as people being pressed around him. One translation says that there were so many people there that the crowds almost crushed him. Uh, you get the idea. You, you get the idea. There were a lot of people jammed together. It was hard for anyone to get to Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you go back to verse 19, previously it talks about a different incidence where there were so many crowds around Jesus that Jesus' mother and Jesus' brothers could not reach him. There were so many people. But this lady was determined. She fought through the crowds. Think of a second obstacle she had. She was in a weakened condition. You know, it would have been one thing for a person in top physical condition to push through the crowd. You know, you know somebody who was going to the gym every single week, they had that membership to UFIT, and they were, they, they, they were working the machines, and they'd been running on the treadmill, and they'd been lifting weights, and they were in physical condition preparing for their encounter with Jesus, but that wasn't this lady. This lady suffered from a prolonged illness. The text says that she had been hemorrhaging for 12 years. As a matter of fact, here's Mark's take on it. Mark chapter 5 and verse 26. Mark says, She had suffered a great deal from many doctors and over the years had spent everything she had to pay for them, but she had not gotten better. In fact, she had gotten worse. Hey, quite frankly, it would have been difficult for this lady to get out of bed let alone to get out of bed, make her way to Jesus and push through the crowds. Here's the third obstacle she had to overcome. She was ceremonially unclean. Now, now we don't live in a, in a Jewish society, but those that live in a Jewish society were very familiar with the Levitical law. And the, and the Levitical law said that a lady who had a continual bleeding was ceremonially unclean. She was ostracized by her family. She was ostracized by her community. Why? She wasn't supposed to leave home. She wasn't supposed to have contact with anyone, let alone a respected rabbi like Jesus. She was ceremonially unclean. The last obstacle simply was she was trying to remain anonymous. This lady had no desire for her condition to be made public. She wasn't like the blind man who stood by the road and yelled out, Jesus, son of Nazareth, healed me. Man, she did it uh, like, you know, uh, like a spy. She kind of snuck in behind him, didn't want anyone to know what she was going through, didn't want anyone to know that she was there. And her mind said, if I can just walk up, if I can touch the back of his garment, he won't even know that I touched him. I can be healed and I can go my way and no one will ever know what took place I just want to remain anonymous she wanted to be as invisible as possible verse 47 says this woman the woman realized that she could not stay hidden <laughs> she tried to be hidden she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him so imagine the story here's Jesus just lands on this, this side of the Sea of Galilee multitudes of people are there to receive him. One of them is the important man, Jairus. Jesus, my 12-year-old daughter is dying. Would you come and heal my daughter? Jesus consents. And the crowd wanting to see a miracle goes with Jesus when all of a sudden in the middle, Jesus stops. He's been touched by this woman. His first miracle has been interrupted. And Jesus is delayed. Notice verse 45 as we continue reading. She reaches out and touches him. The bleeding stops. Jesus immediately asks in verse 45, who touched me? Now imagine, people are pressing on Jesus, so much so that, that they were pushing him in every angle, and all of a sudden Jesus stops and asks the question, who touched me? The text says that everyone denied it. And Peter, you know, rational Peter, argumentative Peter. Peter says, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. 
What do you mean? Who touched you? Verse 46, but Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt the feeling power go out of me. Verse 47, when the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Verse 48, daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And here's what's took place. Upon touching the Lord's garment, she was instantly healed. Although she intended to remain inconspicuous, also she intended to remain even unknown, Jesus would not allow her to remain anonymous. As Jesus is walking along and this woman reaches out and touches him and is miraculously healed, Jesus stops. Now remember what's taking place. There was urgency on his mission. There there was a 12-year-old girl that was dying. So much so that Jairus falls at his knees and begs and pleads. This man of importance, this man of honor and respect falls at Jesus' feet and begs him, Jesus, come quickly, my daughter's dying. And in the midst he's touched and rather than proceeding with urgency, Jesus stops and says, who touched me? As you read in the passage, you can almost sense the, the frustration of Peter. In Peter's mind, this was unbelievable. You can almost hear his frustration as he says, Master, the whole crowd is pressing up against you. Jesus, let's not lose focus here. We're hurrying to save a dying 12-year-old girl. Come on, Jesus, let's get moving. Let's not stop. we got to keep going. But Jesus would have none of it. Jesus stops, and he waits, and he makes an intentional effort to identify the woman who reached out and touched him. Verse 46 says, once again, he said, someone deliberately touched me, for I felt the healing power go out of me. I'm sure the disciples thought, okay, healing power went out of you. You healed her. Praise the Lord. Let's keep going. A 12-year-old girl is dying. Why, Jesus, would you stop to ask such a question when a girl is about to die? Jesus, though, would not be discouraged. He obviously had good reason for pressing the matter. Why would Jesus delay that urgent journey to the house of Jairus only to learn who had touched him? even if it had produced a healing. I want you to catch a couple of things in the passage. The first is this. Jesus' delay was good for the woman who had been healed. Jesus' delay was good for the woman that had been healed. What did it show? First of all, it showed, this delay showed that she was important to God. Now remember, Jesus was going to heal the daughter of Jairus. The leader of the synagogue, why everyone would have understood this man is a man of significance, this man is a man of importance, why we should help him, and Jesus is on the way to help him, when all of a sudden, an unknown, obscure, sick, ostracized, rejected woman reaches out and touches Jesus. And Jesus pauses in the midst of a journey to heal someone of importance, to recognize someone that in the minds of everyone else was not important. Can you sense Peter's words? Jesus, okay, you healed her. Let's go. This is Jairus' daughter, Jesus. Don't lose focus. And Jesus stops and addresses this woman. I don't know whether that means anything to you, but as I read that, that just cried out to me. Because it lets me know that everyone is important to Jesus. You don't have to be a leader of the synagogue. You don't have to be a leader of Hollywood Community Church. You can be unknown. You can be ostracized. You can be sick. You can be rejected. And you are important 
to Jesus. Isn't that a great thought? This morning, you might be here this morning, you might be wondering, does God love me? Does God care for me? Am I forgotten why I'm rejected by this group? Please know that God loves you. And if necessary, God will pause this morning and work in your life just as he did in the life of this woman. This delay showed that she was important to God. The second thing, though, this delay showed that it was her faith in Jesus that made her whole. It wasn't magically touching the garment. There wasn't any mysticism or magic that was involved here. And that was so significant because in Jesus' day, mysticism was so prevalent and magic was so prevalent. There were magicians that that promised to do all kinds of, of parlor room tricks like this. And Jesus was sitting back saying, there's nothing magical in the fringe of my garment. It's not the cloak. It's not the clothes. It's your faith. It is your faith in me that has made you whole. Here's what Jesus is saying. Faith is not intended to be a private matter. I want you to catch that because Jesus could have felt the touch, realized that he healed her and kept going in his mind thinking, praise God, just healed another lady behind me and nobody would have ever known. The only people that would have known would have been Jesus and this lady. But Jesus didn't do that. Because faith is not a private matter. Jesus asked, who touched me? This lady was scared to death. And evidently there must have been a hush that went over the crowd. And certainly she didn't want to come forward and identify herself. But she realized that she could not stay hidden any longer. And the text says, with fear and trembling this lady identified herself imagine what was at risk she who was ceremonially unclean had just touched a rabbi if she admitted to that my word the penalty for that jesus would have been supposedly unuseful for a couple of days according to old testament law she did not want to admit that but jesus forced her to stand up and make a declaration of her faith. She had to confess her faith before men. That's so significant because Jesus refused to go forward until she confessed her faith. Catch that today. Jesus, there's no such thing as an anonymous demonstration of faith. Jesus isn't looking for anonymous invisible believers so many times in this day and age it's you know what man i'm a follower of jesus christ i just would rather not other people i'd rather other people not know about that that was this lady i believe heal me i believe let's just not make a big deal out of it let's not publicize it and jesus was like no 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 who touched me i want a public demonstration of your faith. Hey, hey, church, let me ask you today. Are you, a, are you a public believer or are you a private believer? Are you an anonymous Christian but are you, or are you a Christian that is not afraid to demonstrate your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? You see, Jesus said this in a different passage. He says, you know what? If you confess me before men, I will confess you before my Father which is in heaven. But if you do not confess me before men, I won't confess your Father which is in heaven. Hey, hey, listen, I get it. In this day and age, it's not always politically correct to be a Christian. I realize that we are swimming upstream. We are rowing upstream. And it's becoming more and more politically incorrect to stand up and say, I believe that Jesus is the only way, the only truth, the only life. And I confess Jesus as my Savior. That's not a popular thing to do. But that's exactly what he wants us to do. He wants us to declare our faith. And so Jesus' delay was good for this woman because it not only healed her, but it allowed her to demonstrate her faith 
publicly. Have you made a public profession of faith? Has there ever been a time in your life where you have made a public profession of faith where you have said, I am a follower of Jesus Christ and I am not ashamed of it? You say, Brian, how would I do that? Well, the first way to do that is follow the Lord in believers' baptism. That's what baptism is. It's a public demonstration. Every time we ask the individuals that we're baptizing, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? And their answer is yes. And our response is, then I baptize you, my brother or sister. In the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. It's what? It's a public testimony that they're a follower of Jesus Christ. Have you done that? See, God doesn't want you to be a Christian in secret. He doesn't want you to be an anonymous believer. He wants you to stand up and make a profession of your faith. Jesus' delay was good for this woman, but there's a second thing that I want to see in the passage. Jesus' delay was good for Jairus and his daughter. Now, as you read the rest of the story, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. But you got to get to the end of the story. Notice verse 49 as we continue reading. While he was still speaking, verse 48, Jesus had said to her, your faith has made you well, go in peace. Verse 49, while he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue. He told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the master. There must have been a hush that came over the crowd. Jairus and everyone who was following Jesus knew the urgency of the matter. Why? They had to get to Jairus' house because his daughter was dying. And Jesus had paused to heal this woman. And in the meantime, the little girl died. Can you sense the disappointment? Can you sense Jairus' lack of understanding? He doesn't verbalize it, but no doubt in Jairus' mind, he must be thinking, Jesus, if you had hurried, my little girl would not have died. Jesus, if you hadn't stopped for just a few moments, my little girl would not have died. The messenger says, man, there's no reason to trouble Jesus any further. The little girl is dead. Jesus' response, though, is significant. Verse 50, but when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith, and she will be healed. As we're in the text, we see that all hope had been lost. They'd already said, man, Jesus, okay, no need to come. The girl is gone. As I mentioned, Jairus must have been devastated. He was so close to finding help for her. The famous rabbi Jesus was on his way to heal her. But now all is lost. He'll never get his little girl back. It's too late. There's no reason to bother Jesus any further. Here was the pervading thought. They didn't say it. But here was the pervading thought. This Jesus had the power to heal her disease, but he certainly didn't have the power to raise her from the dead. Jesus, no reason to come. She's dead. She's gone. Verse 50 is the key verse in the entire passage. The key thought is this. When Jesus heard what had happened, he looked at Jairus And you can only imagine the the pastoral, shepherding look that he looked at Jairus. And he tells Jairus, Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith. Now, Now listen, now we understand why he insisted on speaking to the woman. He spoke, he delayed, not just for the woman's sake, but he delayed for Jairus' sake as well. He delayed so that Jairus could believe in him. Here's what Jesus is saying. He not only has power over disease, but he has power over death. His authority, his authority 
is beyond that of any man. And Jesus was eager to use that authority to help Jairus. And he looks at Jairus and he says, Jairus, do not be afraid. Just have faith. Verse 51. When they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter. John, James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but he said, stop weeping. She isn't dead, she's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. You see, here's what was taking place. The crowd had never seen anyone rise from the dead. And as far as they knew, when someone stopped breathing, that was it. But Jesus created life. Jesus knew what came before, and Jesus knows what comes after. Jesus knew that that body was just a temporary dwelling, that the soul lives on forever. He knew that that little girl was not dead. As a matter of fact, he said, she is just dead sleeping and here's what Jesus is saying I'm not only capable of healing his daughter or your daughter from her disease but if necessary I can raise her from the dead just believe don't be afraid just believe let me ask you this morning church what circumstance makes you fear no your circumstances is not the same as that of Jairus's you, Lord willing, will never find yourself in the exact same situation where, where your child is at the point of death and you have nowhere else to turn except to God. But I promise you this, there will be a situation in your life in which there is no remedy, there is no cure, there is no solution, which there is no hope, in which life does not make sense and your only hope is God. There will be a time in your life in which that will take place. Here's the the thought of the passage. Learn that God can be trusted even through life's most difficult circumstances. You see, this delay showed Jairus that God, or that he could trust God even through life's most fearful circumstances. Have you learned that yet? Have you learned that, that God can not only be trusted in the light, but God can be trusted in the darkness. Have you learned today that you can trust God not just when you're on the mountaintop, but that you can trust God when you're in the valley? Have you learned today that you can trust God when there's money in the bank, and you can trust God when there's no money in the bank? Have you learned that you can trust God when the refrigerator's full? And as some of you have experienced, when the refrigerator is not full, and you have no idea where the next meal is coming from, can you trust God? God. You see, Jesus, Jesus allowed that to take place so that Jared would, Jairus would learn that lesson. There's a second thing. Jesus allowed it to take place. The delay showed that Jesus had power over the life and the death of Jairus' daughter. Two verses come to mind. John eleven twenty five. 25. When Jesus rose or Jesus met his friend Lazarus who had died there in John chapter 11, Jesus made this great statement. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live and never die. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18, I'm the living one. I died, but look, I'm alive forever and I hold the keys of death and hell. Hey, here's the idea. Jesus has power over life and Jesus has power over death death now let's get practical Jesus doesn't heal every disease Jesus doesn't raise every person from the dead so pastor I spend more than ample time at the hospital I spend more than enough time at the funeral home and I've spent time with you at the cemetery as we've buried your loved ones at times God doesn't always heal And God doesn't always raise a person from the dead. But Jesus realized that life is beyond this existence. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. You believe in me. Even though you die, you will live. I remember a couple of weeks before I became pastor, there was a lady in our church by the name of Angela. 
Some of you know Angela. Angela had terminal cancer. And you as a church prayed for Angela over and over again. And I watched on video. Bob Barnes was still here. And Angela sat down front. And you as a church gathered around her. And Bob looked at her and he made two so powerful statements. He looked at Angela and he said, Angela, you will be healed. You will either be healed in this life or you will be healed in the next life. But one day you will be healed. A few months later, I preached Angela's funeral. Angela's not dead today. Angela's more alive than any of you and I that are here today. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. Believe in me and you will live even after dying. You see, Jairus needed to learn that. Hey, 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 here's two applications, and I'm done this morning. Two applications. The first is this. The first deals with divine delays because all of us experience delays in our life, times when we think God should act and God hasn't acted Here's the first this, the first application. Divine delays show that God is at work. You ever been in a situation where you prayed for God to do something and it hadn't happened? You prayed for God to heal you. You prayed for God to provide a need. You prayed for God to bring back that wayward son or daughter and you prayed and you prayed and you prayed and you feel like Jairus because you're praying, you're begging, you're seeking and God is working in the lives of other people but he's not working in your life and for some reason there's a delay and you just don't understand it. Here's the challenge when things don't happen the way you want. Don't get mad. Don't get frustrated. Don't get discouraged. Just know that God is at work and God is doing something different. God is doing something better in your life. You see, think about it. If he would have just healed Jairus' daughter, Jairus would have had a great story. But how many people in the New Testament were healed? But how few of people did Jesus rise from the dead? I mean, Jairus had an unbelievable story. Why? Because God had a better, Jairus' plan was for Jesus to come and heal his daughter, but God said, you know what? I got a better plan than that for you. It's going to involve a delay, but I got a better plan than that. If you're in the midst of a delay in your life, be assured that God is at work in your life. God is doing something. Here's the second application. The second application of this, fear is the opposite of faith. Fear is the opposite of faith. You cannot be afraid and trust at the exact same time. Fear and faith are not synonyms. They are antonyms. They are polar opposites. To fear, you have to quit believing. And to believe, you have to quit fearing. That's why Jesus looked at Jairus and he says, don't be afraid. Only believe. Don't be afraid. Just have faith faith. Here's a great song Vicki wrote several years ago that goes right on to this passage. When my heart is torn and broken You hear my pain before I've spoken Guide my thoughts Lord, help me know midst of it all, you're still in control. I'm touching your garment by faith.
Bye.